breast cancer. Those are two words your patients don't want to hear and news that you don't want to deliver. Unfortunately for one in eight American women, it's a truth they'll have to face in their lifetime. And the risks are clear. Besides being female, the two major risk factors for developing breast cancer are advancing age and family history. In fact, about 80% of women diagnosed with invasive breast cancer are age 50 and older. And while family history of the disease is an important risk factor, up to 80% of women diagnosed with breast cancer don't have one. Unfortunately, many women still have misperceptions about who is at risk. They think, I don't have a family history of breast cancer, so I don't need to worry. My mom had breast cancer, but I'm only 43. The good news is that with early detection, we can try to reduce the risk of breast cancer mortality. Through awareness and education, we hope to improve patients' willingness to be screened for breast cancer. To help in this effort, Lilly has created the Strength in Knowing Breast Cancer Awareness Program and website. It's designed to educate women about their individual risks and provide a means for them to share this knowledge with others. At strengthinknowing.com, women can hear from professionals as they discuss the importance of knowing the risks of breast cancer, find out about events they can attend in their city, and help spread the message. The resources may also be helpful to you and your practice. There is strength in knowing about the risks of breast cancer. So spread the word today. Visit strengthinknowing.com and tell your patients to visit too. I didn't realize I was at risk until I visited. I told my sister, my mother, and my aunt. This program is sponsored by Eli Lilly and Company. Answers that matter. You're listening to ReachMD XM 157, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Advances in Women's Health, sponsored in part by Eli Lilly. Your host is Dr. Lawrence Stryker, Assistant Clinical Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Northwestern University Medical School, the Feinberg School of Medicine. The critical window for the initiation of hormone replacement in the postmenopausal patient does it really exist. With me today is Dr. Veronica Ravnikar, the Chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at South Shore Hospital in South Weymouth, Massachusetts. Dr. Ravnikar trained in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Today, we are discussing optimizing cardiovascular and cognitive benefits of hormone replacement therapy by early initiation of therapy. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So estrogen, of course, was originally intended for, and in fact was only FDA approved for treatment of hot flashes and vaginal dryness. And when multiple studies in the 90s suggested that hormone replacement could decrease heart disease in women and prolong life, a lot of doctors encouraged their postmenopausal patients to take estrogen even if they didn't suffer from menopausal symptoms. The Women's Health Initiative, of course, released in 2002, changed all that when that study suggested that women were actually putting themselves at a slightly higher risk of heart attack and stroke. So, Dr. Ravnikar, I'd like you to start by just very briefly reviewing some of the basic flaws of the WHI, specifically in regards to the cardiac data. Well, in terms of the cardiac data, again, the study was set up with the intent of proving the cardiovascular benefit. And so... Just to reiterate, in a very simplistic fashion, say that the intent of the investigators were to get the greatest number of women that would still be healthy, but at the greatest risk of having cardiac disease during the time period of the study. So therefore, when the enrollment came about, the emphasis was to enroll more women over age 60, not over age 50, because these women would be the ones that within the lifetime of the study would be more than likely to have a cardiac event. Well, not to mention those are also the women that weren't having hot flashes, so they wouldn't know if they were getting the real thing or the placebo. And I think that was a huge part of it, you know, that they wanted the older women who weren't symptomatic. That's right, so that women wouldn't go out of the study because then obviously they didn't know what they were on. But epidemiologically and statistically, I think it was basically framed with that because they really wanted to prove a cardiovascular endpoint. In retrospect, when you look at the analysis, you just say, well, what were we thinking? Because the body ages, the reasons that women either genetically or lifestyle-wise have heart attacks, 
by age 60 or 65, you're probably already there. And trying to reverse pathology at that point is a needless effort at times, with, at least with hormone therapy, not with lifestyle. Lifestyle still may help. So in looking back on both the analysis that subsequently came out from WHI and some of the other studies, this critical window hypothesis came out to say, you know, even in the past we've had data to suggest that there's a critical window at which time you should start this therapy so it has benefit. And one of the seminal studies is actually an animal-based study done in monkeys with Dr. Clarkson. And in short, I know it's it's not a human study, it actually showed that when these monkeys were treated with a healthy diet, ovaries taken out, and then they were given a bad diet with hormones, they still had less plaque formation. When they were, again, given a bad diet before they had their ovaries removed, then the bad diet was continued after the ovaries were removed, along with estrogen, they still had very little plaque. Mm -hmm. If they had a healthy diet and then were given a bad diet and no estrogen, they had lots of plaque formation even after giving estrogen towards the tail end of that. So it showed that rescue estrogen after being taken into a postmenopausal state by having the ovaries taken out in these animal models didn't rescue them from heart disease. I mean, that's really fascinating because right there that tells us why WHI data is really invalid. That's right. And then the Nurses Health Study is another model. And all of WHI was based on the great data that came out from the Nurses Health Study, which is still a very profound database. It's done at Harvard. Joanne Manson now is the principal investigator there. And their nurses are followed open label-wise because it's not a double-blinded study, but every two years respond to questionnaires. And data was analyzed between estrogen users and non-users. And that data in the late 80s and early 90s suggested that women who actually take hormones have less heart disease. And there you're actually following women throughout their premenopausal, postmenopausal years. So that database already had women that were younger anyway. Since then, when we go back, even in the WHI database, where the average age of women at entry of the study was 63, they obviously had women from age 50 to 59. Mm -hmm. When they looked back on that data, they actually showed that women on the hormones from age 50 to 59, and this is WHI, the gold standard study, had 33% less heart attacks and actually 30% less overall mortality. Which, of course, is what was reported not very long ago, but did not get the media attention it should have. There's another study that Joanne Manson did looking at calcium in the carotid arteries in those, those women, another subset, and showed the ones that were estrogen users, and this is just with estrogen, versus those that didn't use estrogen had less calcium. And that's actually a, a good peripheral marker of atherosclerosis or bad arteries. So the point is, is that even in WHI now, if you go back to the subset analysis of women between 50 and 59, WHI investigators overall show differing results. And then obviously, Joanne Manson in another subset from WHI showed results more visually with calcium depositions in women who weren't on estrogen versus women that were on estrogen. Mm -hmm. So I think that even in WHI, we've seen that. So there was actually a very interesting model just to look at what estrogen does immediately postmenopausally, even if unfortunately you're on a bad diet, which is not the message to give. But it was just an interesting animal model to test out the hypothesis. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Advances in Women's Health on ReachMD XM157, the channel for medical professionals. I'm Dr. Lauren Stryker, and I'm speaking with Dr. Veronica Ravnikar about the critical window to start hormone extension therapy to get maximum cardiac and cognitive benefit in the postmenopausal years. You know, one thing that's always been a clinical issue for me is that women who have a poor lipid profile are considered to be at slightly increased risk for stroke and myocardial infarction if they take hormone replacement therapy. Yet these are the very women that might most benefit in their cardiovascular function from hormone replacement therapy. So how do you weigh those two? That's tough because concomitant with all of this, we're getting a better idea of how to analyze the postmenopausal woman with some of these inflammatory biomarkers and also with further assessments about body fat analysis, never mind waist size. So as we're looking at this data, we should also be cognizant that we really don't know how to risk stratify individuals, never mind the postmenopausal individual who's obese, who may be more diabetic. Diabetic women are, are more prone to diabetes. Diabetic women are at highest risk of heart disease. 
no matter what their age, even mm-hmm. if they're premenopausal. And ironically, WHI did not show bad results even in that subgroup. But generally speaking, when we look at women who are put on hormones, if they have bad triglycerides and bad cholesterol profile, their triglycerides do go up and also their total cholesterol goes up. In the past, we thought that the fact that concomitantly HDL goes up, that that's somewhat cardioprotective, and now that's felt to be too simplistic of an approach. When you look at other biomarkers, and WHI did this to try to look at whether or not some of those biomarkers would predict stroke in their population, they had no correlation. So people have thrown around C-reactive protein, you know, all these other biomarkers. And even though we know they're inflammatory biomarkers and potentially show that the patient's more at risk, there really isn't any data to necessarily say that that person should not be on estrogen, quite frankly. But because we have bad heart data in the woman over age 65, so to speak, in WHI, it's considered that if a person already has heart disease and those people are considered at highest risk, that estrogen still is not the good thing to give them. You know, it's interesting to me that it's the internists, of course, that treat heart disease, yet they're probably the specialty that's least likely to recommend HRT. And they also seem to be the specialty that encourages women to discontinue it even when they're doing well and their gynecologist has prescribed it. So it's really not fair to ask you this because you're not an internist. Why do you think that is? I think it's interesting. This has also gone through the WHI sort of transition after 2002 and then 2004 when the studies were published and stopped, and especially when the first study was stopped abruptly. The whole model of WHI was based on the cardiovascular endpoint. So I think that when that didn't show a positive result, everybody became very negative. Having said that, the cardiovascular issues and the benefits were more initially brought up by the cardiologist. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, who's since deceased in Tennessee, was one of the foremost people promoting estrogen for prevention of coronary atherosclerosis and showed and had a lot of studies to that endpoint. And so I remember, you know, and I give lots of lectures on this, I remember before WHI when I'd go to speak to audiences, and I always try to give a very balanced approach to the data, I had cardiologists come up to me and say, why are you even saying anything negative about estrogen and heart disease? It's protective. That's its end point. Now everybody's gone the opposite route and said, absolutely not. Well, thanks to Dr. Ravnikar, who's been our guest, and we have been discussing the importance of timing of hormone extension on cardiac and cognitive function. Call us toll-free with your comments and suggestions at 888-MD-XM-157. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Advances in Women's Health, sponsored in part by Eli Lilly, with your host, Dr. Lauren Stryker. For more details on the interviews and conversations in this week's show or to download the segment, please go to reachmd.com forward slash women's health.